Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night Lab. I'm Tom Zinn and I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you James Edward Mills. He's with the Nelson Institute and the Joy Trip Project. It's going to talk with us about the adventure gap, changing the face of the outdoors. But first, I get to ask him five questions. James, where were you born? I was born in Los Angeles, California. What neighborhoods? In Lamert Park. Which part? Lamert Park. I have never heard of Lamert. Not very many people have it. It's becoming very famous. It's becoming gentrified, which we'll talk about at great length in this lecture. Today. Thank you. And then where'd you go to high school? I went to the Pilgrim Day School. At the graduating class of 12. Nice. That's and, a dozen. And even dozen. Yeah. It's about how many people lived through the winter of 16, 20, 21. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> okay. And then where did you go for uh, college? Uh, University of California at Berkeley. And do you have any uh, advanced degrees? Um, I do not. I, I have 30 years of lived professional experience. Way to go. L LPE, that's good. Yeah, I like that. You now work uh, for the Nelson Institute, and what do you do for the Nelson Institute? Um, formally, um, I am a the community li relations liaison for the Nelson Institute. I also am a guest lecturer, and I teach a summer course called um, Outdoors for All. And it's an undergraduate seminar on diversity, equity, inclusion in public land management. Excellent, and I love anybody who can liaise. So that's, that's I'm leaving now. I used to write speeches and I failed. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I had a great time writing up the little missive from last night, thinking how important being out in the uh, wilderness, especially the Boundary Waters, was for me at a young age. I hope everybody gets that opportunity. Please join me in welcoming James Edward Mills to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Topic now. Well, good evening, everyone. I can't tell you how happy I am to have this opportunity to not only speak in front of a live audience, but also to engage what is probably thousands of people at home um, watching this talk that I've actually given so many times, I have a hard time believing that anybody in Dane County hasn't heard this yet. So thank you very much for being here. And if you're, you're hearing this for um, the second or third time, I'm, I try to make it better every week. So first of all, um, as Tom had mentioned, um, I am a um, employee of the University of Wisconsin at the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, but I'm also a, a freelance journalist and independent media producer. And I have a, a specialty in outdoor recreation and environmental conservation, but a further specialty in uh, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to the management of our public land. And much of what I'm gonna talk to you about is based on research and uh, project work that I've done for the book that I, I'm going to talk to you about tonight called The Adventure Gap. Now, some of you might recognize this landscape. If you don't, um, I can tell you that this is about a quarter of the way down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. And in the summer of 2016, um, what is described as the centennial summers, the um, the summer of the 100th anniversary of the national park system, I won the lottery. And by that, I mean that I was part of a group of people that won the lottery for a unguided trip down the Grand Canyon. Now, anybody who knows anything at all about public land management knows that many of our natural resources are regulated through a system of, of permits that are issued by lottery. And in this year, um, myself and 14 friends um, put together a flotilla of five boats um, with three people each. And we basically made our way from one end of the Grand Canyon, starting at uh, Lee's Ferry, uh, making a trip of 14 days, over 227 miles uh, down the, the Grand Canyon, along the Colorado River, all the way to the uh, Hopi Havasupai Reservation at the end. And through the course of this trip, I started to, to come to realize what a great privilege this was. Now, I was invited on this trip by my good friend, Jim Moss. And Jim, who I've known for 
over 25 years, 15 of those years we spent applying for the lottery to get onto this trip. And every year we would be denied and every year we would reapply. And we realized that if we kept applying, our chances would, be get, would get better and indeed they would. And so finally, when the centennial summer of 2016 came around, we got our permit and we put this trip together. And about halfway through our journeys, we're making our way down the Grand Canyon. Every night we'd spend a evening with um, cocktails and conversation and a campfire. And as we're sitting there one evening, Jim leans over to me and says, you know, I've been leading trips down the Grand Canyon as a professional guide for over 40 years. And you're the first black person I've ever guided. And that was actually very telling to me because someone with that much experience, having spent so much time down there, you'd think that there would be other people of color. But as it happens, as I explained, it takes a lot just to get down there. Because when we stop and we think about the division between who spends time in nature and who doesn't, we need to take a look at what some of those prohibitions are. And the Grand Canyon, I think, is a really good example of how we can illustrate some of these disparities. For example, it's estimated that 4.5 million people will visit the rim of the Grand Canyon every year, 4.5 million human beings. But only 29,000 people a year will make the trip that we make. So 4.5 million versus 29,000. And basically the reason why the number is so low is because that is the number of people that the National Park Service has determined can safely pee in the Colorado River without compromising the environment. <laughs> it, and that's the magic number, 29,000 people. Because if you, the minute you get to 29,000 and one person, everything gets thrown out of whack. And so in order to maintain the integrity of the natural resource, we have to limit the number to 29,000. Now that's not to say that black people, people of color, Native Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans don't visit the Grand Canyon. In fact, they do. Um, on the way out and as we were visiting with folks coming out of the Grand Canyon, we actually met quite a few um, people who came out to en enjoy this, um, this natural, natural resource. But from what we can describe as an adventure experience, like, I did, like we were having on this river, it was actually very limited. And so much of what we're gonna be talking about tonight is how we can ultimately increase the number of people who can actively engage in activities like this. Now, as I mentioned, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and this is actually a photograph um, taken not far from where I grew up in the neighborhood that I, I uh, referred to a minute ago as Lemur Park. In fact, um, my parents live right there. And this is the neighborhood that I grew up in. And this photograph was taken um, in an area, and this is the exact geolocation of the house that I grew up in in Los Angeles, California. And that photograph was taken um, in this spot called the Baldwin Hill Scenic Overlook. And the view that you see there um, is, is exactly three miles from where I grew up. And from that spot, you can literally see all of downtown Los Angeles. And in the distance, you can see the San Gabriel Mountains. And if you go there today, there's an amazing system of trails. And these trails are, um, are well-traveled by people using this resource for recreation. There's an interpretive ranger that leads tours through the area to talk about the flora and the fauna of this particular area. And what's remarkable is that this is in a very densely populated portion of Los Angeles. And as these photographs illustrate, the population is actually very representative of the people who use this resource as well as the people who live in this community. And that is basically a product of much of the socioeconomic and political progress that Los Angeles has made over the last 60 years through the civil rights movement. But when I was a kid in the 1960s, the same area looked more like this. Um, it was actually then and continues to be a area of of quite a bit of energy extraction. There's active oil, um, oil wells in this area. And this is primarily a black and Hispanic neighborhood. And at the time it was basically considered a place of urban blight and um, wasn't going to be a site for urban renewal. In fact, instead it was a, a place for um, ecologic um, destruction. But through the civil rights movement, along with the 
issues of housing and employment, much of the development of this particular area was centered around the importance of environmental protection. Now, you'll all probably recognize the guy on your left. <laughs> That's Martin Luther King Jr. The guy on the right is my dad. <laughs> uh, my father, uh, Billy Jean Mills, was the first African-American to graduate from UCLA Law School in 1954. Uh, he was also um, one of the first sitting city councilmen of African descent um, in the city of Los Angeles. And in the um, early 1960s, um, it, it's this photograph in the Los Angeles Sentinel illustrates Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. writes, illustrates with Billy Mill, um, discusses with Billy Mills some of the problems in King, Dr. King's campaign to win equal rights in the Southern integration movement now being conducted in Alabama. So in the early 1960s, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Los Angeles, California, asked my dad for advice. So you can only imagine what that does to a young person when they're trying to decide what they're going to do with their life. It really set for me a very high bar in terms of what I was expected to do as an adult growing up. Because my dad was an amazing guy. He was quite the mover and shaper in Los Angeles at the time. In fact, this photograph, um, he's standing there next to the men in military uniform. Sitting next to him is Mayor Tom Bradley, who's the first Black mayor of Los Angeles. And he's shaking hands with John F. Kennedy. And whenever noted dignitaries would come to Los Angeles, my dad would be there to greet them. And under many circumstances, there would be my dad grinning into the camera while he's um, meeting with and engaging with many of the leading civil rights activists at the time. And he and my mom and my entire family was actually very deeply engaged and involved in the civil rights struggle in the 1960s. But what was most interesting about my dad was that he was also a Boy Scout leader. And it was really important for him to not only fight for the civil rights of my family and our community to spend time in our cities, but also to be able to spend time in nature. And so from a very young age, I was exposed to the outdoors. And it was as a young kid um, in, the, in the areas around the San Bernardino Mountains that we could see from the bluffs of our neighborhood. We would travel to these areas to have um, weekend getaways. Um, we would go skiing, we would go camping, we would go hiking. This was my life growing up. And as I became you know, more enamored with um, my life in the outdoors and decided that I wanted to do something as a career, shortly after I graduated from college, I worked for the campus outing club at the University of California, Berkeley, um, called Cal Adventures. And this picture was taken in Yosemite on my very first uh, trip as a rock climbing instructor. Um, shortly after graduation, um, I made my very first um, trip as an adult to the Grand Canyon. I'd gone when I was a kid, but this was me um, with my very best friend, John Mayer. The two of us hiked down uh, to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and actually camped at Phantom Ranch. Um, after that, I went on to um, enjoy other really great adventures, including uh, this trip where a group of friends and I made it to the summit of Mount Whitney, the highest peak in the lower 48 um, um, uh, states of the United States. Um, this photograph marks the beginning of my professional career. Um, shortly after I graduated from college, I worked for a little company that you might have heard, heard of called REI. Um, and I ran the rental department at the Berkeley store, and they liked what I did so much that I decided I was going to make a transfer over to customer service at another little company that you heard of called the North Face. Mm -hmm. And in, two, in 1992, um, I was hired to be the very first um, African-American sales representative to work in the Midwest Territory. In fact, that's what brought me to Madison. Um, from 1992 to 1995, I ran the entire um, sales department for the North Face in this part of the country. In fact, I managed a territory that I like to describe as the Louisiana Purchase. Um, because it included Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, North and South Dakota, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And I literally drove that territory for the next 10 years with me and my dog in, an explore, in a Ford Explorer truck and just had a fabulous time. And after um, um, working, um, selling hiking boots, tents, and sleeping bags to people in stores that you probably shop at, like Fontana, and some of you probably remember the old Erewhon stores. Um, I also worked um, doing um, some 
international guiding. This is a photograph of my good friend, Carl Jacobs, and I circumnavigating Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Um, I went on to have some really great climbing excursions and um, enjoyed a fabulous career, got married, bought a house, lived my life. But one of the things that I noticed that many of you probably noticed in these photographs is that I, I was almost always the only person of color in any of the professional and personal experiences that I was having in the outdoors. And I didn't know why. And I was trying to understand exactly what was causing that. And when I started making noise in my professional life in sales and marketing, I started getting some pushback from the industry, quite literally having sales managers tell me, James, that's just not our market. And I didn't understand that either. How are cold people in need of clothing not your market? You know, how are people who have an interest in spending time in the outdoors not something or some people that you would want to sell products to? And so around the events of 9-11 in 2001, I made a career change. I closed down my sales and marketing agency. I retrained as a journalist, um, got a job working um, as a business reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal and completely changed my career, working on stories about the importance of environmental protection, finding the stories, especially of people of color, you know, people who had backgrounds similar to mine that were making their way in the outdoors, but for some reason weren't very visible. And in 2009, I created a blog and a podcast series called The Joy Trip Project. Um, which is now in its 14th season. Um, it's available on online and also on iTunes. And if you're interested in hearing some stories, many of which I'll tell you this evening, um, this is my online platform where I tell narratives about why it's so important to share the outdoors with a, a, the broadest cross-section of the American po um, populace as possible. Now, all of this really came to a head shortly after I started my online platform um, with the introduction of a film that some of you might have heard of called The National Parks, America's Best Idea. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend it. It's available on YouTube, on iTunes. It's um, a fabulous 12-hour miniseries um, written and directed by um, famed um, filmmaker Ken Burns. And in 2009, I had the rare privilege to be able to actually go to Yosemite and personally interview Ken Burns and a guy who looks a lot like John Muir. <laughs> in fact, um, Lee Stetson um, is an actor who actually plays Muir in this documentary series in period voice and clothing about what the Park Service was like in its creation. And I was really excited to quite literally get a master class on the history, heritage, and legacy of the very beginning of public land management, going all the way back to the very beginning. And I asked Burns in our conversation, so how are you going to make the national parks and the stories of the national parks more accessible to the underrepresented segments of the population that we seldom see in the outdoors? And he proceeded to tell me something that I'd never heard before. Now, in 1903, when this photograph was taken, John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt are having a conversation about how they're going to protect and preserve these wild and scenic places. And at the turn of the century, Teddy Roosevelt did what Teddy Roosevelt does. He sent in the army. And in the earliest parts um, of the conversation around protecting our national parks, what we wound up doing was sitting in military occupying forces to be able to protect, patrol, and preserve this public land because it was subject to all kinds of things that caused parks damage. Forest fires, poachers, um, people who are illegally grazing sheep. All of these things were putting this natural resource at risk. And what Burns told me next quite literally changed my life because in 1903, over 400 members of the U.S. Army, a unit known as the Buffalo Soldiers, an all-Black unit of cavalrymen, were tasked to protect and patrol Yosemite. They essentially were the first park rangers. And I told you that I grew up in California. I lived my entire life in the outdoors. And here I am in my mid-40s hearing this story for the very first time. And little did I know, I had history, heritage, and legacy that was directly related to people who share my ancestry. And this is a story that I'd never heard before. 
And so that drove me to start thinking about what other stories I don't know. So I wanted to know as much as I could about the Buffalo Soldiers. And I discovered that they were led by a man by the name of Charles Young. And Charles Young was the third African-American to graduate from West Point. But he was the first superintendent of Sequoia National Park. In fact, many of the policies and systems of management that are in place today that protect the giant sequoias and the redwood trees that are there today were put in place by Charles Young over 100 years ago. And in fact, at the time, there was a, a concerted effort to log this, um, the national forest to basically create lumber to build homes in San Francisco. Charles Young put an end to that. And it was these policies that ultimately created the earliest permutations of the national park system, right up to and including the creation of the very first museum in the national park. The Arboretum in Yosemite was created by Charles Young. The road leading to Mount Whitney was paved and built by the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, they created picnic areas and campgrounds that are still there today. And yet, here we are 100 years later, and I've never heard of them before. Because ironically, while there were 400 African-Americans patrolling Yosemite in 1903, today there's only one. My friend Shelton Johnson is the only permanently stationed African-American park ranger in Yosemite today. Now there are park rangers who are people of color who patrol Yosemite, but he's the only one who shows up there 365 days a, a, a year, 24 seven. He's the guy who lives there, he works there. And just like Shel uh, uh, Lee Stetson in period dress and clothing, he tells the story of what it was like to be a Buffalo soldier in the 1900s. And ultimately Brown's visitors in the story of what it was like to be a black person in Yosemite at the time. And when the film, The National Parks was presented at the White House, Shelton was in the audience to tell the story to President Obama. And I honestly believe that not unlike Muir's meeting with Roosevelt, Johnson's meeting with Obama set the stage for one of the, um, the leading presidents when it comes to the preservation of public land. In fact, in his eight year administration, um, Barack Obama designated 26 national monuments, um, right up to and including the creation of the memorial to, um, uh, to Charles Young. Now, if you go to Yosemite today, what's remarkable is that it is indeed a natural setting that is well-preserved. But now when we tell the story, it does indeed include the, the importance and contributions of African-Americans. And now when people of color visit the park, there are stories that ultimately share this narrative. And so my goal is that ultimately we will have a reflection of the population that is directly reflective of the population as a, as a whole, protecting and preserving our national parks well into the future. And that gets us to what is perhaps a more academic description of what I describe as the, the adventure gap. So Black Americans currently represent 13.1% of the US population, but we represent less between two and 7% of national park visitors. And when you take a look at our population from the year 2000 to the year 2014, the nation's black population grew 35% faster than the population as a whole. And it's estimated that the black population is expected to grow from 45.7 million today to 74.5 million, making up 17.9% of the total US population by the year 2060. So if we take a look at that exponential growth across several ethnic, and, um, and socioeconomic demographics, we're starting to see an expansion of people of color in the population. So it's estimated that by the year 2045, um, we will live in what can be described as a majority minority population. So what happens if we have a clear distribution of population that is in, in excess of 50% that has no direct relationship with the natural world? What happens if we have an emerging population that is not directly connected to the protection and preservation of our natural resources? What happens if we fail to engage this emerging demographic? And that's the crucial question to all of this, because it's not just a matter of whether or not people of color do or don't spend time in nature. The question is, who will spend time protecting and preserving nature in the future? 
because we definitely have an opportunity now to make the outdoors more accessible to a broader cross section of the American public. But in order to understand where we're going, we have to understand exactly how did we get here? Now, a lot of people will begin conversations about civil rights or um, racial disparities in this country with slavery. We don't have to go back that far. We really only need to go back to the, the Jim Crow era of the, of the early 20th century, because it's at this time when we had the beginning of the period in, in our history where we start thinking about the preservation of public land. This photograph of, of the Grand Canyon taken in the 1920s um, coincides with a trip taken by a leading black evangelist at the time by the name of W.E.B. Du Bois. And on a visit to the Grand Canyon in 1920, he wrote, why do not those who are scarred by the, bat by the world's battle and, and hurt in, by its hardness travel to these places of beauty, drown themselves in the utter joy of life? So at the time, there was a, a profound interest for people of color to spend time in nature, to actually be part of this movement to protect and preserve our wild and scenic places. But what happened? Because when we stop and we think about the, the grounding principles in 1903, the same year that the Buffalo Soldiers were patrolling Yosemite, the um, creation of Yellowstone um, was established at, at the park entrance for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. But unfortunately, at the time, under the aegis of then President Woodrow Wilson, in 1916, when the National Park Service was, um, was created um, in the um, in an act of Congress, it did not include the interests of people of color. Woodrow Wilson was the very first post-Civil War Southern elect, uh, Southerner to be elected as president. And he literally took the principles of Jim Crow segregation of the South and introduced it into the federal government. So that when in 1903, we had 400 members of the US Cavalry who were uh, black Americans, um, these same men went on to fight in the Second World War. Um, this is a photograph of a unit, um, many of whom um, were members of the Buffalo Soldiers, a unit then called the, the Harlem Hellfighters, um, who fought valiantly in the, um, in the First World War, came home um, to a segregated America. And unfortunately, because of the, the, the philosophies of Woodrow Wilson, the national parks and most areas of public service were closed to African-Americans. So that the same Buffalo soldiers that served in Yosemite as park rangers in 1903 could not return after World War I to civilian life as park rangers. And that would be true all the way up through the 1950s. Our natural areas, including our national parks, were designated um, with the same levels and degrees of racial discrimination that have occurred across all of um, modern society. And it wasn't just in the South. Um, all of our modes of transportation were segregated by race. Our beaches, our, all of our forms of recreation were also designated by race. And what was especially telling um, is an issue called redlining. Um, essentially a policy created in the 1930s during the depression that designated areas where people could live based on their socioeconomics. And I can look at my own personal relationship with the outdoors in terms of my, my personal background as to um, how we get to where we are today. Now, at the very beginning of my talk, I showed you this story, um, this photograph of where I grew up. Um, this is a redlining map created in the 1930s um, and this is basically a breakdown of the red areas in the communities where are um, designated for um, um, where um, black and Hispanic people are allowed to live. And these are very urban areas with very little green space. If you take a look in the green portion in the upper um, regions, that is where the, um, the prime real estate is. In fact, that, that big green spot right there, that's Beverly Hills, California. And it's these areas that are near green spaces that are open to, um, to recreational opportunities that were essentially denied to people of color. And it's interesting though, because um, as I explained to you with regard to my own personal relationship with um, my father and the role that he wanted to play in terms of making the outdoors more accessible to his family and his community, while the civil rights movement is going on, we're talking about 
a variety of different things that many of the, the same things that we're talking about today. We're talking about housing discrimination. We're talking about access to fair wages, to the ability to live and to work where we want to. Much of this was defined in this moment in time in 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. is defining for the American people what he described as his dream. And this photograph is taken at the March on Washington. And in front of 250,000 people, he essentially defines what he would hope that the nation would become. And it's at that moment where he defined what he would hope would be a world in which a person could be judged not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. But what's interesting is the very last paragraph of the I Have a Dream speech reads, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Now, he's talking metaphorically. You know, I don't think that he was necessarily speaking literally, but the case could be made that maybe he was. So in the um, September issue of Ebony Magazine, a month later, the March on Washington is the, the top story. On page 87, there's an interesting story about a man by the name of Charles Madison Crenshaw, who's described as a weekend climber. And um, he is a, um, a, a Boeing employee who lives in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, Washington. Um, Charles Madison Crenshaw was a member of the famed Tuskegee Airmen. In World War II, he was a flight engineer working on the planes that were flying bomber escort missions um, over the European theater. Um, he served his, his country valiantly in the Second World War, came back to this country, got a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Chicago in 1952. But he was told by his instructors and many of the people that he was studying under that quote, it would be very unlikely that you will find a, a career in your chosen profession as a Negro. So disavowing all that, he relocates to Seattle, gets a job for the Boeing Corporation and is employed working on the um, Apollo lunar lander module missions. He's quite literally helping to put men on the moon. But he's also a member of the Seattle Mountaineers. He's an avid outdoorsman and spends quite a bit of, of time um, climbing and working in the areas of the Rocky Mountain National Park, as well as on um, uh, setting new routes on Mount Rainier. And in 1930, in 1964, when the 37th expedition to reach the summit of the highest peak in North America, a mountain then known as Mount McKinley, was being put together, Crenshaw was the very first person to be invited. And in a team of 15 climbers, um, they ascended to the mountain um, and essentially he ultimately became the first African-American to reach the highest summit in America. And what's remarkable is that seven days earlier, Martin Luther King Jr. is overlooking the shoulder of Lyndon Johnson as a civil rights act is being signed into law. Seven days later, Crenshaw literally personifies King's Mountain Dream, taking it out of the realm, realm of metaphor and into the realm of reality. But what is interesting is that when you take a look at this photograph of the summit, it's really difficult to tell who the black guy is. Okay, just so you know, Crenshaw is the guy on the far left. The guy on the far right is Alan Randall, the expedition leader. The person in the middle is Alan Randall's wife, Frances. That's a woman. She became the third woman to reach the summit of Denali. What's remarkable is that this photograph, I think, beautifully demonstrates that the color of your skin has nothing to do with your aspirations to spend time in nature. Mountains don't discriminate. Neither, neither does altitude, gravity, low temperatures. We're all judged ostensibly by our character. And it's in nature that we can ultimately find our ultimate expression of what it means to be um, free as an American. And in his journal, after the expedition was over, Crenshaw described his uh, sin as the following. It had been so easy today for most of the climbers that it had been hard for them to realize they were actually standing on the summit of Mount McKinley, the highest point of North America. Climbers found themselves searching through the clouds for something yet higher. And that something yet higher is that aspiration to actually go beyond the physical limitations of 
cold weather, altitude, gravity, et cetera, and aspire to something more. And I believe that that something more is the ability to share our love and passion for the outdoors, not as a solitary pursuit, but in the pursuit of making the outdoors more accessible to more people. So in, 19, in 2014, working with the National Outdoor Leadership School, also known as Knowles, we quite literally went around the country and tried to find people of color who were working directly with the mountaineering community to become role models in their areas so that they could ultimately become heroes in their community. Um, we recruited nine climbers, a total of six men, three women, ranging in age between 16 and um, 57. And we did something that had yet to be done before. We quite literally put together a team of climbers that would become the first team that would make an attempt on the highest peak in North America, quite literally taking King's Mountain Dream as personified by Crenshaw in the 1960s and bring it forward into the present to create a modern expression of this expedition that we called Expedition Denali. And it was essentially a visual representation of the world that we ultimately want to see. Um, it was the subject of my book, The Adventure Gap, and also the focus of a documentary film called An American Ascent. And it's from this adventure that we're quite literally able to change the face of adventure so that we can have representation across the board of men and women who are people of color who quite literally change what we think about when we imagine what it is to be a mountaineer. And it's from these people that came back to their home communities to share their experience that helped to encourage um, not only careers in, um, in outdoor recreation, but also in, um, in environmental conservation and preservation. And um, we were actually invited to the Obama White House to share this story of adventure with over 350 um, Black and Hispanic young people in the Baltimore, Washington, DC area, and ultimately helped to create a new series of what can only be described as affinity groups, um, organizations that work specifically to engage and inspire um, young people who are on the margins of our society that, for whatever reason, don't have access to nature in the numbers that we would like to see. So we have representation um, for um, Black and Brown women in, in climbing, outdoor representation in um, the Latino community, the Native American community, um, what we describe as unlikely hikers, people for a variety of different reasons who don't spend time outside, and also people from the LGBTQ community. And so now that when we go to national conferences and we visit areas of professional discourse, we actually see a much more representative cross-section of people of color in these experiences. And through the course of my career as a writer and a journalist, I've had the, pri the privilege of writing um, a few magazine articles um, regarding the importance of being able to redefine um, what it is that adventure looks like. And it's from these images that we ultimately are able to redefine what it means to be a person in the outdoors. Um, what's really gratifying is that from that first expedition, the youngest female member of our, of our team, um, Rosemary Saul, the young woman um, kneeling on the bottom, um, went on um, two years later to lead the very first all black American summit of Kilimanjaro in Africa. And just this summer, um, she along with a couple of other members of our team um, went on to be um, to create the very first all black team to make it to the summit of Mount Everest. And that happened um, in April of this year. And we're still kind of excited about it because it's been a great story. Um, I had the, the privilege of actually walking um, to base camp to be able to uh, tell this story and share it with you today. Um, because it's from these narratives that we can ultimately make it so that people will see themselves as part of the natural environment. But then we have to ask ourselves this question. Now, after we've done all of this, are we done? Because a lot of people would suggest, oh, we've solved all the problems. Everybody's equal. We don't need to worry about these things anymore. The reality is that there are, there's still a long way to go. The summer of 2020 in particular demonstrated to us how bad things can get. Um, the, the case of Ahmad Arbery, for example, a young man out for a jog who was literally hunt, hunt, hunted down and killed simply for being in the wrong neighborhood. Um, we have a wide variety of other expressions where we need to be able to tell stories that are communicative of why it is important that we not only 
define spaces that are open and available to people, but also share their stories. Uh, my good friend Latria Graham is a fabulous writer who, um, along with me, writes stories for um, Outside Magazine, for Backpacker, for Rock and Ice. She did a fabulous story in 2018 called um, We're Here, You Just Don't See Us, basically talking about the lack of representation. And in 20, um, 2020, she wrote another story for Outside Magazine um, that described a negative experience that she had in Great Smoky Mountain National Park, where she was quite literally accosted by complete strangers who decided that it was a place where she didn't belong. Okay, this, was in, this was two summers ago. And shortly after this article came out in September of that same year, um, this happened at the park. Someone had shot and killed a black bear and hung its pelt over the entrance sign of Great Smoky Mountain National Park with a sign that reads, Black Lives Don't Matter. So the reality is that despite everything that we've accomplished, there's still a lot of negative pressure that limits the experience of people of color to spend time in the outdoors. Even organizations like the Sierra Club are starting to unpack some of the um, the racism and um, divisive narratives that have been part of the modern um, outdoor recreation and environmental movement. But I think that if we can work with our institutions on the lo local level, as local as possible, we can make substantive change. Um, I have the privilege of being the vice president of the board of the Aldo Leopold Nature Center. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it is a uh, experiential education facility in Monona that carries on the legacy of Aldo Leopold. And working with this organization, I try to create very explicit language that defines why diversity is important. And so now when you go on our website, it reads, we believe that diverse communities are healthier in nature and in society. When we are thoughtful about being inclusive in how we engage, educate, and empower, we help our community to know that nature is for everyone and is a safe place to learn and explore. So this is now embedded in our DNA as an institution. And I think that it's critically important that we do that wherever we possibly can. I also formally sat on the board of the Ice Age Trail Alliance, and we took a very similar strategy towards our language here in which we describe the Alliance acknowledges that in order to be a truly diverse and inclusive organization, we must, be, we must exercise commitment to these goals in the ways that we do business and how we interact with one another, our external partners and the general public. In support of the mission of the Alliance, we're committed to recruiting, engaging, supporting, and cultivating leadership throughout all the communities we aim to serve. So by using this very explicit language, um, we can actually create a place in the outdoors that is indeed open and engaging to everyone. And most importantly, so that we will create a safe and inclusive environment for young people so that when they visit and explore the outdoors, they'll do so with the joy and happiness that I think we all will. And through the course of my work in moving this conversation forward on a national level, part of what many park rangers, including my friend Shelton at Yosemite and other um, rangers around the country are telling more inclusive narratives about the role that black Americans have played, not only in the creation of our national parks, but America as a whole. And um, this year working with the National Geographic Society, um, I'm working on a new book project um, that tells the story of African-American history as interpreted by the National Park Service, a project that we call Unhidden. And the goal, not unlike the story of the Buffalo Soldier, Soldiers, is to find those narratives that are inclusive of a wide variety of different people that will be inclusive of everyone in the preservation of our national heritage. So um, look forward to seeing that hopefully um, in 2024. I think what we can draw from the final conclusion is from out of this mountain of despair, there's indeed a stone of hope. If you go to the Washington, um, Washington DC at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, um, that is the inscription that reads on um, his statue because it's that narrative of being able to find hope in the ascension of mountains and our time in the outdoors that I think we can ultimately achieve the, the change that we all hope to um, achieve. So um, I wanna say thank you very much for allowing me to speak with you tonight. In the 15 minutes that remains, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, please, if you have any other questions or would like to learn more about the work I do, you can find me at 
joytripproject.com. And if you scan this QR code, you'll get my business card. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for your time and attention. And I have to answer your questions now. And I'll stop sharing my screen and open it up to the, the, the broader audience. Everyone at home. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the answer is yes and no. Okay, it was in some areas, but it wasn't in others. Um, in in quite a few though, um, there were um, integrated units, but they were primarily in California, um, in parts of um, the West, but in the South, definitely not. You know, and many of those areas were discriminated when it came to, um, you know, housing, rates of pay, um, and the, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps came to an end at the beginning of World War II, and then everyone went into the military, but the military was segregated. And it wasn't until Eleanor Roosevelt at the end of the Second World War worked with Mary, Mary McLeod Methune to integrate the national parks so that um, they would begin to um, create recreational spaces for returning GIs to have a place to enjoy themselves. It wasn't until 1953 that the national parks were formally desegregated. And the first black park rangers weren't um, actively recruited until 1963. So it's a very, very, very long period from 1903 to 1963 that was completely devoid of black representation in the National Park Service. But thanks for your question. Someone else? Yeah, I was wondering if you could say a little more about uh, this incident of this woman who was, I guess, assaulted in a national park. And was that specifically due to racial motivations? Because I know that, you know, there's an increasing number these days of uh, attacks and violence, say on the Appalachian Trail and numerous other. Uh, other natural areas. And so, I mean, that's definitely a growing problem. Absolutely. You know, and I think that it, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible, you know, to know exactly what's in the mind of someone who's committing an act of violence. Mm -hmm. it, but when it's perpetrated um, explicitly towards a woman of color who's in a national park by herself, she's in a, an incredibly vulnerable state. So we can just, we can parse out what this person's motivation is the bottom line in this particular case, this particular person was at risk. We need to make sure that whenever possible, we make people feel safe in our national parks. But again, this incident with the bear pelt, it occurred two days after her, um, her outside magazine article appeared. And uh, again, um, we can perhaps draw causality or not, but the fact of the matter is that these things are still continuing to happen. And I think that we need to collectively decide that we're not going to stand for it. Another question. Perhaps in our audience online, you can write your questions in the in the chat. Can you see the chat? I can't, but hopefully someone can read them for me. Okay. If, you want to if they if they if they appear. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask. How did you come up with these two really great, um, great parks, the Adventure Cap and the Joy Trip Project? <laughs> the Joy Trip Project, yes. Well, no, it's a Joy Trip Project. See, it should have been a club. Oh, <laughs> well, see, I mean, and, and that, that's the interesting thing, because I mean, as a... No, it, no it's, it's okay. Well, you know, I so, saw, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I began my career in sales and marketing, you know, and catchphrases and short words that can be very easily turned into memes and um, you know, easily read URLs, et cetera. You quite literally do an exercise of, of wordsmithing. And um, you know, the adventure gap was kind of like a, a, a no brainer because we I was mainly looking at a variety of other types of gaps that we were talking about. You know, there's the, the housing gap, the education gap, you know, the, um, the, um, the digi gap, you know, um, and talking about access and thinking, well, there's clearly an adventure gap, you know, because, you know, when you take a look at the major accomplishments, 
that have happened in, um, in, in, in mountaineering. For example, the first person to summit Everest um, was Sir Edmund Hillary in 1953. 10 years later, the first American summits Everest in 1963, a gentleman by the name of Jim Whitaker. Um, Charles Crenshaw summits Denali in 1964. And for all intents and purposes, that should have been the beginning of black representation in mountaineering, but you don't get another person to summit Everest who's a person of color until 2006. So almost 50 years goes by from the first summit of Everest to the first black summit of Everest. And then it took another 14 years to put together an all African-American team. You know, and so that very clearly de de defines for me that division that ultimately creates the adventure gap. In terms of the Deutsche project, being those were the three words that I wanted to connote in the work that I do. Joy to connote happiness, a trip as in travel project, as in terms of an, an ongoing concern, because it's always going to be something that I'm doing, hopefully. So joytripproject.com. So check it out. Plus it's on your computer. That, yeah, that too. <laughs> 18 years of doing Wednesday night 11. First oh, thank you. It's all, it's all about branding. <laughs> Other questions? Anyone? <laughs> Yeah, they're in the back. Oh, they're in front. Save yourself a trip. Take this young lady's. All right. All right. He, he was he was moving. He was already in motion. So, so how do you how do you overcome the economic problem? Okay, that's a that's a great question. You know, and and that's the, that's the interesting part of this as well because you know much of this division is also socioeconomic. Okay. But unfortunately, socioeconomic disparities also fall along racial lines, which also fall along the disparities that are historic to this country. You know, and so um, while there is no direct correlation between being a person of color and not spending time in nature because you can't afford it, okay, it is there. Okay. And so basically the way you correct that um, is to remove the barriers to access that are socioeconomically based. So for example, just this past weekend, I led a group of, of that we describe as BIPOC, which is a black indigenous persons of color group um, to the upper peninsula of Michigan uh, to learn how to fly fish, okay? And if anybody has ever fly fished before, it is incredibly expensive in terms of all the gear that you need. Um, you know, being able to access a fishable river, to be able to get to a place, to be able to stay in a place. Uh, I got some grant funding from some um, from some thoughtful people. Um, we were able to um, uh, provide um, equipment, clo um, clothing items, transportation, food, lodging, and a small stipend for 10 people um, to go fishing in one of the most beautiful places that you can fly fish. In fact, Ernest Hemingway wrote about fly fishing in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So we were actually able to remove the socioeconomic and cultural barriers to make this experience possible with the intention of having these folks go back into their communities with this experience and hopefully share what they learned with people closer to home. You know, and so people will invest money in things that are important to them. Okay, so the socioeconomics of this is kind of a, a, a lost leader. Um, if it matters to you to spend time in nature, you're going to make the investment of time and money. Um, if it matters to you to play video games, you're going to do that. You know, what would we rather people do as a culture and a society? Hopefully, we would encourage people to support um, environmental protection and not spend our times having vulturable experiences on our couches in our living rooms at home. You know, and so we can get over the socioeconomic barriers if we are very explicit about how we target the communities that we most wanna reach and encourage them to, to help the people in their neighborhoods to do the same thing. Other questions? I'm trying to follow up on that question, but I'm looking at Pew Research. But I wonder if, if we follow an analogy of Native Americans reclaiming the, the game of the cross. Is it something similar in the African American community that get you off more of the voice and have some uh, meaning for that community? Sure. So, reclaiming space of all kinds, I think, is critically important. So, again, um, the Buffalo Soldier story for me personally 
grounded me in Yosemite historically. And so now I feel like I have a vested um, relationship in that area. So now I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm part of it. The same thing is ultimately true of a lot of places. For example, it, not far from where I grew up um, is a, a, a spot in Los Angeles called um, Brown's Beach. And it had been taken from a black family who had a small resort there and basically uh, you know, taken uh, under the uh, providence of eminent domain. And they'd been kicked out for two generations. It was just recently returned to them. You know, so it just recently made the news. I mean, these are the kinds of stories. I mean, and the great thing about these narratives is that it helps us to ground people in who they are, where they are. So if you take a look, for example, at um, um, Biscayne National Park in Florida, um, that was originally owned by um, a black fisherman who was offered $7 million in the 1930s for this site, knowing that it was going to be converted into a resort community. He sold it to the Park Service for $1 million and the guarantee that he can stay on the house and that they will give him um, a key lime pie for uh, Thanksgiving dinner for the rest of his life. Okay, but it was because of his contribution that that is now one of the most beautiful national parks that you will ever see to this day. And I think that as long as we can continue to tell people the story that that park is only there because of the the, magnet, the magnanimous gesture of a very generous black man that you can say, yes, I belong here. This is part of who I am. And these stories appear across the landscape, you know, from um, Buffalo soldiers who actually um, were part of the gold rush um, and the Klondike, you know, you have black whalers um, in, the, um, in the Northeast. Um, you know, you have these amazing stories of people of color who were um, involved in the um, the Spanish conquest of North America, you know, it's these stories that ultimately will, I hope, allow people to reclaim their heritage simply through their narratives. Um, I, I see it a, a question: Any advice for young people of color looking to get into uh, the natural resources field? Yes, <laughs> uh, get a degree in environmental science if you can. Um, at the very least, um, a lot of young people are constantly being recruited as interns um, to serve in um, uh, remote duty stations for the National Park Service. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had the, the privilege of sharing the same presentation to a, a group of first year um, interns. These young people were literally all over the country getting paid to spend time in the outdoors doing fabulous work in environmental science, in forestry, in um, historic res uh, preservation, a wide variety of different things. Um, that I think is the best place to start. Hopefully, um, you know, we can create other opportunities like the work that we're doing at the Nelson Center, um, the Nelson, I'm sorry, the Aldo Leopold Nature Center, where we quite literally have a experiential education preschool you know, so that from toddler age, we're getting young people and we're working on recruiting more uh, families and communities of color to get their kids at a very early age into our, our, um, our, our, it, our field and our projects to be able to have these kinds of positive experiences so that when they become older and they start thinking about what careers that they're, they're, going, to, they're going to want to have, they will have that early experience to draw on as, um, from when they were kids. Okay. And, and um, it's eight o'clock. I'm I can do this all night, but just for the, <laughs> the sake of our audience, we'll, we'll take this this question and then I'll probably close it out. Please. Uh, is your book or your future books going to be available as audio books? That's a good question. Um, and in fact, I think it's really just a matter of me deciding that I'm going to stand in front of a, a microphone and read it. Um, but um, thank you for asking. I, I will work on it. You mentioned the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, what is the origin of the National Park Rangers wearing the campaign caps? That's a very good question. And, and there's some, some thought as to you know, what the origin of the campaign hat, the flat hat that you see on, on most park rangers. Um, essentially, it's the same campaign hat that um, the Rough Riders wore in um, 
the um, the you know the charge of San Juan Hill with the um, with uh, Theodore Roosevelt. There's a lot of cross pollination between the U.S. Army and the National Park Service. As I as I said before, the very first park rangers were soldiers. Um, so when they were creating uniforms, they probably weren't being very imaginative in terms of the variation that they might have. The campaign hat worked um, for mounted um, horseback riders. It worked great for park rangers, and it's been that way ever since. I noticed in the picture um, of you at the transom that that was a Johnson outboard motor. <laughs> Not a Mercury. Not a Mercury, right. Not a Beaver. Or a right. Does anybody know where Johnson used to be? Oshkosh? I don't know. No. I, I can't remember. I, I, I thought you were, you were asking because you knew. And you're going to tell us. Well, no, my grandpa had a dead brood, so. <laughs> and I think there's no walk. Dave, name for me, ever brood. <laughs> and uh, any other questions? Yeah, here's here's a bit of trivia. Um, are you familiar with the name Stephen Bishop? I am. Oh, okay, great. Yes. Well, then I was going to ask. Uh, you should also start uh, promoting. Uh, opportunities in caving for people like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you for bringing that up. And, and, and in fact, if you listen to my podcast, The Joy Trip Project, you can get it on Apple, um, iTunes, etc. Um, there's an interview with a gentleman by the name of Jerry Bransford. And Jerry Bransford is not unlike Shelton Johnson, the only um, park ranger at Mammoth Cave National Park in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And his great, 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 great grandfather um, was a guide with Stephen Bishop, who uh, in 1939, Mammoth Cave became perhaps the, the, the first tourist attraction in North America. People were literally coming into Mammoth Cave to visit the biggest cave in the world, 400 miles underground of, of cave systems. It's, it's exquisite for from 19... From 1839 to 1945, when it was designated as a national park, it was guided almost exclusively by black men. And they um, and Stephen Bishop was one of the very first guides who led tours down there. He actually um, led a tour of, of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And, and there's actually pictographs of, of Emerson writing on the walls in Mammoth Cave, and Stephen Bishop was there. But what's interesting is that when Mammoth Cave became the 26th National Park in 1945, it was um, close to um, Black people as being park rangers. So they were literally all asked to leave, along with the entire Native American population that was still living there at the time. You know, and so you have this amazing heritage and legacy of, of Black folks taking care of a wild and scenic area, a, 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 a tremendous cave. And the introduction of the National Park Service forced them to leave. And it wasn't until um, uh, Jerry Bransford at the age of 65, as a retired person, um, was able to become a park ranger in Mammoth Cave. And he's, he's been there ever since. He's, um, he's gonna be 60, 78 this summer. You know, so these stories are there. You know, and we just have to look for them. And the more I find, the more excited I am because there's there's constantly these new narratives that are grounded exquisitely in our national parks, but unfortunately are not often told. And it's only when we tell these stories that we'll actually be able to carry on that that legacy even further. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now. Um, how many of you have seen the the, the movie Pearl Harbor um, with Ben Affleck? Okay, there's an, an amazing scene at the very beginning where Cuba Gooding Jr., um, who's playing the part of a man by the name of Doris Miller, and Doris Miller was a, um, a um, seaman who, um, in the middle of the Battle of Pearl Harbor, um, jumps on a machine gun and takes out Japanese, Japanese airplanes as they're flying into a ship, saves hundreds of people, quite literally becomes the very first hero of the, first, of the Second World War. You know, gets the Navy Cross. Um, they they've erected um, uh, statues in his honor. Um, the next battleship is going to be named after him, and that's our next. I mean, so the next aircraft carrier 
is going to be named after him. All other aircraft carriers are named after presidents. This one is going to be named after a black man by the name of Doris Miller. Okay, so fast forward to 2019. How many of you have seen the, the, the movie Midway? Okay, a few of you have. The, the exact same scene happens, but Hollywood basically took the Doris Miller character out and put in a white character and did the exact same scene that appeared in the 2001 movie and completely erases Doris Miller from the narrative. So if you watch that new movie that was created just a couple of years ago, you would think that there wasn't a single black person in the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Okay, so that's what happens when we fail to tell these stories, we forget them. And when, as we forget them, we completely wipe them out. And so that a generation from now, young people will ask themselves, were we there? Were we part of this when it happened? Just like for me to be in my 40s, having lived in California my entire life, only then to learn that the Buffalo soldiers were there 100 years earlier. And that's what I hope much of my work will do to be able to um, ground people in their heritage so that they can ultimately become part of the future. So I'm going to leave it there. Let's see if anyone has any questions. Absolutely. Thank you very, <laughs> very much. Thank you very much.